The way we see is duplicated in many ways by the camera, but there are important differences. This man can look and focus his attention wherever he likes on the world in front of him. The periphery, the edge of his vision, is vaguely defined and changes constantly as he moves. But when he looks through the camera, he sees this. It's only a section, a part of the world in front of him. We can put it this way. We can say the camera puts a frame around the world. It's as if the camera places this frame literally between the world and the filmmaker. When the camera moves back and gives you a wide view of the park, it tells you more about the young couple, even though they are only tiny specks in the frame. You now know that they are alone together. You know a little more of their story. And we can bring up the sound. The lesson here is that we can see everything inside the frame. It is part of the story. But we can only imagine what happens outside the frame. The frame creates a border in space. It surrounds the space within the frame, which extends back from the lens in a kind of a pyramid, and it creates off-screen space. We can describe six kinds of off-screen space. The space above the frame, the space below the frame, the space to my left, your right, camera right, the space to my right, your left, camera left, the space behind the camera, and there's a sixth kind of space within the frame. <coughs> Off-screen space can only become concrete space or real space when the audience sees it. As I said before, it can exist in your imagination. But once you see it, it becomes part of the real concrete space of the filmmaker. Off-screen space can become real space when it's reflected by something inside the frame. painting on a wall, I'm aware, amongst other things, of the physical properties of the picture frame, its colour and texture. If you compare this with a projected image, it's obvious that here the frame is a different thing. The darkness of the room helps, of course, but here we are much more aware of looking past the frame to the world beyond. So the frame around a moving projected image becomes the edge of the real world and the beginning of the world that the filmmaker is revealing to us. It's more like looking through a window than at a flat picture. When I look through a window, I'm aware of the boundaries of the window frame, and I can move to change those boundaries. But the audience watching a screen can only see what the filmmaker has chosen to show. And because that is all the audience sees of the filmmaker's world, this series of images can create its own reality, its own unique time and place. The camera puts a frame around the world. 
and it can isolate sections of the world. It enlarges those sections to fill the whole screen. So in one way, we are seeing less of the world, and in another, we're seeing more. Here, Tom is going to touch the edges of the television frame. He's discovering the space he occupies on the screen. People off camera, especially the crew, need to know where the edge of frame is so they can work outside it. Antonioni is quoted as saying, the beauty of a shot depends on whether or not it explains what it seeks to explain. That's what I'm getting at when I say you could subtitle this film, How Much Do You Want to Show? Where you put the frame and how much you show depends on what you're trying to say. The space around this black shape makes it seem very small. But when it fills the space, it can appear to be forcing the edges of the frame away, or sucking them in. The scale, or size of things in relation to the frame, becomes more important than their real size and there's a connection between the frame and everything within it. So what sort of thing is the frame? can direct the attention of the audience to specific parts of the screen and create a frame within the frame. one of the most powerful elements of visual language, the reveal. The reveal need not be a zoom. It can be any of a number of devices. It depends on the tension that is set up between what lies inside the frame and what lies outside it. We can also talk about framing in the third dimension. In this shot, Margaret is not moving, and the camera is getting closer to her. What's happening? Thank you. 
modeling of the players and setting and the greatest audience involvement result when the camera is brought as close as possible to record the scene without distorting the images. In other words, move the camera in and use the widest lens you can. Now, fashions and theories change, and I'm not going to suggest that there are rules like this in books like this that must be followed. But what is important is that we learn how moving the camera and changing our point of view can alter what we photograph. Here, the camera operator is filming a shot of Tom and Margaret talking to each other across a table over on the left of your screen. This is his shot, a simple two shot with the faces in profile. Now we want to see Tom's face, but still see both figures. The operator moves the camera to shoot over Margaret's shoulder. Here's the shot, a mid shot of Tom with Margaret filling the right hand side of frame. He can get a similar shot when he moves closer. And yet now Tom seems much further away. The same thing with the matching shots of Margaret. Looking over Tom's shoulder, a mid shot, and a similar shot with the camera closer to Tom and she seems paradoxically much further away. One thing is clear. We can manipulate the appearance of distance between the two figures. We can alter the third dimension. A few days ago I came here and took two photographs with this camera. First of all I used a wide angle lens, a 35mm lens with a short focal length. Then I changed to a 135mm lens, a much longer focal length with a much narrower angle of view, often loosely called a telephoto lens or misleadingly called a close-up lens. And I took two photographs of this scene. Now, we've done some blow-ups of those two shots and I want you to be able to compare them. First of all, the wide-angle shot. You can see almost all of the bridge and there's this expanse of water and the boats in the foreground to give the photograph a strong sense of depth. Now, what we've done is cut away all but the central section of the photograph showing the opera house. And we've enlarged that section of the negative to produce a print which is the same size as the first. It's easy to see that the enlargement has made no difference to the relationships of the various elements in the picture. And that is what perspective is about. The apparent relationship of things to each other in space seen from one point of view. Let's look at the shot I took with the long lens, the long focal length lens, the 135mm lens. It's identical in every respect with the blow up of the section from the wide shot. Except that while I was changing lenses, this ferry moved closer to circular key and one of the boats drifted slightly. Apart from that, the two shots are the same. In particular, look at the relationship of the post in the foreground to the Opera House and the Garden Island Crane, which is behind the Opera House and more than a kilometre away from it. If you compare the two photographs, you'll see that these details are identical. In fact, the only way of telling these two shots apart is the graininess of this one, where we've enlarged a very small section of the first negative. What this proves is that simply changing the focal length of the lens from short to long or anywhere in between doesn't alter perspective. And one of the commonest truisms repeated about photography, that long lenses compress space and short lenses push things apart, is stated like that simply quite false. What they do do is cut out different size sections of the world in front of the camera. Here's another demonstration of the same principle. 
we fit a camera with three fixed lenses of different focal lengths, 10mm, 25mm and 50mm. The scene in front of the camera consists of a number of objects, including a black frame and the figure of Tom who sits reading. The camera is mounted on a dolly so that it can move towards or away from the black frame. We can compare what different lenses take and we can see what happens when we move the camera. We begin by looking at the shots taken with the three lenses. The 50mm takes this view. It records the area exactly inside the black frame. The 25mm lens has a wider angle of view, so now we can see the black frame and some space around it. The 10mm lens is a big jump, a much wider angle of view, and we see much more of the scene. But the same thing we saw with the Opera House is happening here. The different lenses are cutting out different sized sections of the world, and the perspective within the black frame is not changing. When we keep the film rolling, you can see the three lenses successively sliding into place and the section of the scene cut out by the black frame, which is exactly what the 50mm lens sees, remains unchanged like a postage stamp just stuck on the scene, only its size changes. Perspective changes when things move or you change your point of view, that is, move the camera. Now with a 10mm lens fitted, the camera will be moved closer to Tom. Two things happen. He gets larger on the screen and he appears to move away from the background. It's not a trick of the lens, it duplicates what we see with our eyes. There is a real change in perspective. When we replace the three fixed lenses with a zoom lens, we can demonstrate the same principle. But now, we can alter the scale of the image as the camera moves forward, so that we see exactly what the black frame encloses at each moment. Now the change in perspective caused by the change in the position of the camera becomes dramatically clear. In practical terms, all this means is that we keep two things in mind when manipulating depth. The distance between the camera and the subject and the focal length of the lens. A great deal of what is called distortion is, again, only a duplication of what we see. If I reach out and touch your face, you see something like this, a huge hand compared to the size of my head, but, in real life, our brain's correct for the apparent distortion. What we know changes what we see. What we're dealing with here are not genuine distortions at all, but natural manifestations of perspective. motion pictures is a good one for what goes on in cinema and television because the filmmaker is always concerned with movement. Movement is change. Change of position, change of posture, change of appearance. For many living things, the ability to accurately recognize movement is a matter of survival. It has been said but the most important sound in music is silence. 
and the most important movement for the filmmaker can be stillness. In this film, I want to distinguish three areas of movement. Movement that occurs within the frame and the frame remains perfectly still. Movement of the frame itself. And finally, movement of the camera. Movement can fill the frame. Movement can have a strong direction in the frame. And a strong sense of movement can be created without moving the frame. Some people become quite frightened about keeping the camera and the frame still. And yet one of the great action directors, John Ford, is credited with saying, nail down your camera and depend on the cutting. In other words, Work with a static camera and don't be tempted into moving it. second mean with the camera station that is by frame many of the aspects of motion pictures duplicate our own processes of observation our ability to follow or scan with our eyes is duplicated by the panning and tilting movements of the camera when we talk about panning or tilting we're talking about swiveling the camera around a fixed point in space in the same way that we move our eyeballs and our heads, or what amounts to the same thing, our heads on our shoulders. If the camera duplicates what the eye does, it produces a series of jerky, interrupted movements, which can be very tiring to watch. The effect of swiveling the camera vertically or horizontally is that we move the frame around the visual field. So here, the similarity with human experience ends, because when we move our eyes around the world, we fix our attention rapidly on points of interest, and we're not aware of a fixed periphery or edge to our vision. When the frame moves slowly over a scene, our eyes have a chance to do what they normally do, fixing on points for long enough to take them in, and then moving on. The timing of this sort of surveying movement is obviously critically important. Too fast and the shot becomes nonsense. Too slow and it can lag behind the viewer's perception. A movement like this can help to relate two areas geographically. But a panning or tilting movement over areas of no visual interest can be a big waste of time. This shot has no middle. So it is often better to take John Ford's advice and rely on cutting. Many of the difficulties with that sort of surveying movement can be avoided when a moving subject is being followed. Finding a visual reason for the movement helps to keep the audience's concentration within the scene. here allows you to survey the surroundings as the subject moves through them. And the movement need not end 
if there is a cut to a similar moving shot. Another way to move the frame is to use the zoom lens. When zoom lenses first appeared, many filmmakers avoided them because the lenses were of poor optical quality and because the zooming movement seemed to attract unnecessary attention to the mechanics of the medium. Familiarity and perhaps a more self-conscious style of filmmaking have changed this, but it is possible to disguise zooming movements. For example, a zoom can be combined with a pan. The zoom imitates in a most interesting way how our attention, our awareness operates. We seem to look at things in wide shot and then select points of interest and direct our attention to them, excluding the surroundings. So the success of a zooming movement is not so much a matter of the mechanism itself, but rather whether or not it is appropriately used. The most frequent misunderstanding about the zoom lens is the idea that it alters perspective. But perspective only changes when we change our point of view, when we alter our position in relation to what we're looking at. So a true change of perspective can only be achieved by moving the camera. Movement is life itself. When the camera moves, it becomes alive, searching out aspects of the world around it and even participating in the events taking place. Suddenly, the third dimension, depth, becomes apparent as the different layers of the scene move in relation to one another. switching it on and walking. And on a small screen like television, jerky and uneven camera movement is less obtrusive than it is in the cinema. Lightweight, noiseless cameras shooting for television have helped to break down many of the old rigid rules. Nevertheless, the carefully mounted camera that slides smoothly and effortlessly through the world can be a delight to watch. <laughs> 